All right, guys, how's it going? After the longest, most drawn-out introduction in graphics card history, AMD finally launched Vega a couple of days ago at SciGraph. Now, you still can't get hold of the cards. They'll become available on the 14th of August. So let's take a look at what we'll be getting. Now, AMD revealed three cards, four including the Nano version, but we don't have specs on that yet. At the top, we have the Radeon RX Vega 64 Liquid Cooled Edition followed by the Radeon RX Vega 64, obviously that's the air-cooled edition, and the Radeon RX Vega 56. Now these are of course all based on the same silicon. It's the same GPU, the Radeon Vega 56 is just a cut down version. As we can see with the names, it's based on how many next generation compute units they have, either 64 or 56. Looking at the clock speeds, there's quite a difference between especially the Radeon 56 and the liquid cooled edition, with a few single digit percentage differences in the boost clock. All of the cards have the same 8 gigabytes of high bandwidth cache, which is of course HBM2. And the power numbers are pretty interesting. This liquid cooled edition, 345 watts, 295 watts for the air cooled edition, and 210 watts, which is quite a drop actually on the Vega 56. Now instantly when I saw this, it just made me think we're seeing the same thing again as we saw with Polaris. Chances are Vega will be quite efficient at lower wattages, lower clock speeds, but once you push it just that little bit further, well, we can see what happens to the board power. This is a common tactic employed by AMD now. It's basically what they did with Fury X and the Fury Nano as well. And we can actually see the power efficiency using 3D marks per Lin noise benchmark. Very interesting in fact, because AMD is actually admitting that they are not as efficient as Pascal, at least not in this benchmark. But at 220 watts, the power efficiency is down below 2.5, but Vega at 150 watts, which we believe may well be the wattage of the Vega Nano, isn't that far behind the GTX 1080 Founders Edition. Still quite interesting to see AMD admitting that they have still not caught up to Pascal in power efficiency. Now here's a mugshot of the three cards, pretty good looking cards it has to be said. There's a limited edition version of the Vega 64 as well, and again all should be available in the middle of August. Now with this launch AMD has introduced Radeon PAX, which allows you to buy Vega as part of a bundle deal, which includes $200 off a certain FreeSync monitor, a Samsung ultra wide monitor, which incidentally seems to have an issue with FreeSync, take a proper look at that before you go for this one, also $100 off a Ryzen 7 and Gigabyte X370 motherboard, which looks like a reasonable deal if you don't already have a Ryzen 7. This is only the 1700X and 1800X though, and obviously the X370 motherboard is a little bit more expensive, but that one could well be worth it if you are considering say the 1700X which is starting to look like really good value, and also two free games, Wolfenstein 2 and Prey. Now all of this varies by region, for example if you're in the EU you don't get this $200 monitor deal, and I'm not entirely sure about the motherboard and Ryzen 7 deal either. But all this is well worth considering if you're in the market for an entire new system. Now looking at the Radeon pack prices, you can see the Radeon Aqua pack, that's the liquid cooled version at 699 USD, and the Radeon Black and Radeon RX Vega 64 air-cooled at 599 USD. Basically speaking, you're paying $100 for the pack, you're getting a couple of games for that, and you're getting money off. I'm not blown away by these in all honesty, but again, if you're in the market for all of this, then it might make sense. So just taking a look at the price rundown, again, 699 for the top Radeon Aqua pack, 599 for the black, and 499 for the red, with the cheapest red pack, being down to the RX Vega 56 graphics card. You can of course buy them separately, but only the 64 air-cooled and only the Vega 56. So that's 499 for Vega 64 air-cooled and 399 for Vega 56. So these will be the bog standard prices. You're talking 499 for the Vega 64 and 399 for Vega 56. The only way to get the liquid cooled or the limited edition 64 is through buying one of these packs. So AMD is calling the Vega 64 the new GPU king under $500, and Vega 56 will be the ultimate Radeon FreeSync gaming card, starting at $399. Now you're not going to buy a graphics card without first of all knowing the performance, and we got one or two benchmarks. Doom, consider this best case, ultra wide 1440p, ultra settings and Vulkan, and we can see that the RX Vega 64 comes in at 12% ahead of the GTX 1080 Founders Edition, and 31% ahead of the Fury X. Now this is the Vega 64 Air Edition, not the Liquid Cooled Edition. And the Liquid Cooled Edition is probably going to come in between 5 and 10% faster in most benchmarks. But if we consider this as best case, and judging by what else AMD has said, Vega 64 trade blows 
with the 1080 Founders Edition. So judging by that, the Liquid Cooled Edition should certainly beat the 1080 Founders Edition more often than it loses, and should in fact be decent competition with some of the aftermarket 1080s. Later on we saw some really questionable marketing slides, Really not impressed with this one. They're talking about the FreeSync ultrawide gaming zone and how the GTX 1080 falls below it. But this one on the right hand side is particularly bad. As we can see that in most cases, the actual 99% minimum FPS, the 1080 is actually ahead of the Vega 64. In one, two, three cases, while coming well behind in Forza and slightly behind in BF1. But because the Vega 64 is at the right hand side, it gives the impression of being faster anyway. This is right out of the NVIDIA school of marketing, this one. Absolute garbage. Don't fall for any of that crap. Now, it's safe to say that a lot of people were expecting more. And a lot's been said about AMD's new drawstream binning rasterizer, which as I discussed in an earlier video, may not have been switched on in the drivers. And in fact, AMD said that the DSBR was not available to the Vega Frontier Edition. So that should go some way to explaining why the Vega Frontier Edition performed quite poorly in the benchmarks. But don't expect any miraculous improvements over what AMD is showing us. Because as we can see here, DSBR is working in current drivers and this chart shows how much more efficient it is. Take note that this is not a percentage uplift in performance, it is simply the bytes per frame saved due to DSBR. It may contribute 5-10% in some corner cases, maybe slightly more. We just don't know yet. Now taking a quick look through some of the other slides, AMD claims that there are over 100 games where Vega will run 4K 60 plus FPS. Now if you take a closer look at them, some of them are pretty old games, so no great surprise there. But one of the more interesting slides I saw was this one, which starts off asking the question, what does an enthusiast seek? And then the follow up slide was this one, does an enthusiast seek technology and specs? Or is it benchmarks? Is it value? Or is it a buttery smooth experience? It's a very interesting question. And this made me rethink my own position on Vega. Obviously, since the beginning of this year, I have been one of the most outspoken critics of Vega in terms of its ultimate performance. And one of the reasons for that is we knew that the die size was very large. It's basically the same size as GP102, NVIDIA's Titan X, or their 1080 Ti. And yet Vega's performance is a lot closer to the much smaller GP104, that is a GTX 1080. And as an enthusiast, and as somebody who is very interested in the economics, and of course the engineering side of things, I do tend to look at die size comparisons a lot. And it simply does not look good for AMD because on that metric, they are very, very far behind. Could be talking 30 to 40% behind a Titan X at the same die size. And we've already seen that they're not quite there on power either. But with that said, we've seen the technology as well. The high bandwidth cache controller, HBM, and a bunch of new stuff coming as well, like the Rapid Pack Math, the FP16. And we just recently found out that the new Wolfenstein 2 will support FP16 and of course Vulcan. In my last Vega video, I mentioned that I do expect Vega to catch and possibly overtake the 1080 Ti over time. And this is basically what I was talking about. The FP16 Far Cry 5 will also use FP16 on Vega. So that's what I was talking about there. Vega is a new architecture. It's the most advanced DX12 architecture out there and stuff like FP16 will give it a further advantage. Whether or not it can make up that big gap to the 1080 Ti, I'm just not sure. But compared to cards like the 1080, then yes, it should certainly pull away. So really, that's all about the technology here. Now, AMD's been talking about this buttery smooth experience as well. This is all about the FreeSync thing and again, the high bandwidth cache controller and their minimum frame rates. And value, yeah, obviously, that's a big factor. But too many of us, it's really all about the benchmarks. It's about winning. And this is why a lot of people are disappointed in Vega. But a few months ago at the Financial Analyst Day, I said, I got over this months ago. I am well and truly over this. In fact, it was when I did the GPU War Is Over video, when I realized that Nvidia is out of sight almost in terms of ultimate performance. And architecturally, in gaming at least, they have the fastest cards and it will remain that way for a long time. The thing here for me is this, when I look at the die sizes of Vega and GP102, it's bad from a competition standpoint. 
this is why NVIDIA charges so much for their graphics cards. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized Vega really was built for the data center and the professional markets, because those are markets where Vega will sell and sell pretty well. These are markets where AMD has consistently been catching up on NVIDIA. NVIDIA still has the massive market share, of course, but AMD is catching them there and they are able to sell graphics cards at what is really high prices. $8,000 for a Vega SSG, that's a lot of money. And effectively what it means is the gaming performance simply is not there. Maxwell, Pascal, pure gaming cards, it's just not possible for AMD to catch up with them when they have one architecture to cover every market. But what it really comes down to is this, you don't care about that. You don't care about die sizes. It makes no difference to you. What matters to you is the value proposition. What are you getting for your money? A quick look at Newegg, GTX 1070, $460. I mean, Christ, $450 for a GTX 1070? These have gone up in price since they launched. Now, obviously, there's all the mining thing going on as well, so that's certainly not helping. But looking at the Vega 56, $399? I mean, yeah, it's a cut-down card, but it's only cut down by 14% in the stream processors. The base clock doesn't look all that great, but the boost clock's not too bad. And this Vega 56, is guaranteed to be a pretty good overclocker. Looking at the board power, it's not that far away from a GTX 1070. Maybe using another 30, 40 watts, but coming in 50 bucks less with what should be a very good overclocking card, I would expect the Vega 56 to be clearly ahead of the GTX 1070 at a lower price. And of course, you've got to consider the free sync proposition. The GTX 1070, I got one from MSI and I used it for a little while. But every single time I saw screen tearing on my free sync monitor, I thought to myself, I'm going to stick the 580 back in my PC because I really don't want this screen tearing. So what it comes down to here is, yeah, the liquid cooled edition, it should just about beat the 1080, maybe even match the aftermarket 1080s. But the power draw looks astronomical to me. The normal Vega 64 power draw is not going to look good compared to the 1080. It's going to win some, it's going to lose some. And overall, I don't think very many people will be losing their heads over this card. But the Vega 56, good overclocker. If you don't want to overclock, the board power is more than palatable at just over 200 watts. You're getting all the great technology like the high bandwidth cache and the HBM2. You get all the future proofing stuff like the FP16. If you've got a FreeSync monitor, you are getting that buttery smooth experience. And obviously, at $399, you're certainly getting the value there. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be faster than the GTX 1070 as well. So for me, this is likely to become the card to get at that price range where a lot of people are thinking, this is just about my limit. I am prepared to pay $400 for this graphics card. And certainly on paper, at least, looks like the clear value choice. But that remains to be seen. I'm not sure if AMD is seeding any of these out to the press or not. I've got no idea. I don't have one. I know that. And I may not get one. Has obviously, I've been quite a harsh critic over these past few months. But the Vega 56 has made me feel better about the whole thing. AMD isn't competing with the 1080 Ti. They're not competing with the Titan X. And in terms of the 1080, they're not going to look very efficient there. But they may well just have beaten the 1070 in everything. Features, performance, price, while also retaining a lot more future proofing with the FP16. These are the things that the vast majority of people buying graphics cards should care about. But for those of you paying up to a grand or even more, NVIDIA is going to remain the clear choice. And you know what? I'm absolutely fine with that because I would never spend a grand on a graphics card anyway. I'll catch you later, guys.